Well, good morning. You've survived childbirth and hopefully the first unit of this course. You've passed in uh, your essays on that and I should be getting them back to you uh, by the end of this week. And now in this course, we're finally going to start talking about uh, children. Uh, I encourage you for each of the units that follow to take some time and to look at children around you in your environments. Some of you have children of different ages. Uh, many of you have friends, neighbors, and siblings with children of different ages. And there's nothing uh, that helps you better apply what you're learning than to uh, read in your text and uh, use the discussion boards and the websites and then balance that with direct observation. For example, for this unit, uh, when you go to the supermarket, uh, notice uh, the two-month-old infant who is uh, blissfully sleeping in the carriage as uh, her mother uh, pushes her around the aisles. Or uh, notice uh, uh, the 10-month-old or 12-month-old uh, baby boy who's staring at you uh, while uh, being held by his dad in the line at the bank and who is noticing your facial expressions and is mimicking them as well. Uh, with slightly older uh, toddlers, uh, uh, listen to their language and the way in which they uh, use very simple words, the baby talk that they uh, seem to prefer, and the qualities of their speech and what they talk about. There's so much going on in these first two to three years that you'll be reading about uh, that there are endless opportunities uh, to observe and to notice things that you may not have noticed before. What I want to talk with you about today a little bit is physical motor growth. Uh, in each of the units that follow in this course, the very first thing you'll read about is physical motor growth. And some people wonder, well, is this psychology, is this physiology? Well, it's both, of course. Uh, there are important reasons for psychologists to look at physical growth. Uh, first of all, uh, observing children is the best way to see the maturational changes that occur over time, the order and the sequence of abilities, the increasing specialization of skills that accompanies not just motor growth, which we can see directly, but also cognitive and emotional growth as well. Uh, looking at physical growth also helps us to notice what the boundaries of abilities are for children of different ages. For infants, for example, the ability to uh, sit up allows them to look at more things, and the ability to crawl and later to walk allows them to explore on their own uh, a wider world around them. It's also important to notice what's going on physically at every age because that affects how we as adults and others in the community uh, look at children and what their expectations are. Uh, kids who are taller may be treated differently than kids who are short. Uh, kids who are heavy may be treated differently than kids who are slight. Uh, our whole attitude towards infancy is influenced by uh, the vulnerability and the smallness of size of newborns. And it changes fairly quickly as children become uh, less passive, more active, more interactive uh, by the end of the first year and certainly into the second year. So as children grow physically, our responses to them, our understandings of them, and our uh, interactions with them change directly. Uh, the other thing that uh, I think is associated with physical growth that's uh, worth mentioning now is that as children grow, their growth affects their own feelings about themselves and what they're capable of. There's a tendency uh, that we see right off the bat in infancy and toddlerhood and it continues throughout childhood. And that is that children will try to maximize the use of the skills that they have available. If a child can crawl, he will. If a child can walk uh, from one place to another, she'll do that. If she can hold a spoon by herself, she wants to. And later in toddlerhood, it's almost a mantra of the period 
that children will say, I'll do it myself. And why? Because they're able to do it. Of course, they may put the shoes on the wrong feet or uh, the shirt on backwards, but their desire to do for themselves what they're capable of uh, is central to their own sense of self and their sense of self-esteem. And as parents and caregivers, it's important to reflect upon how we can help children to feel uh, as empowered as they are able to feel at different points throughout childhood. Well, uh, a few things to talk about then about physical growth uh, during the infant-toddler period. First of all, of course, it's very rapid. Just to give you a sort of by the numbers, uh, the typical child at birth uh, is about seven to seven and a half pounds. Uh, and by the time they're five months old, they've doubled their birth weight. By their first birthday, they'll be triple their birth weight. And by the time they're two years old, they will be four times their birth weight, or 28 to 30 pounds. In a similar way, the typical baby at birth is so oh, about 20 inches, 18 to 22 inches in length. And by the time that child is one year of age, uh, he'll be 10 to 12 inches taller. In fact, uh, and this is something that's hard for people uh, at first to uh, think is true, by the time a child is two years old, they're approximately one half of their adult height. So uh, in the second year, uh, they've continued to grow rapidly at the rate of about six inches. And later on in childhood, growth rates will slow down to about two to three inches a year. Uh, and then accelerate again as we get towards adolescence. Uh, so there's a lot of growth in height and weight. Uh, there's also a lot of growth in the uh, ability of um, and uh, opportunities to use muscles through the body. Uh, essentially growth proceeds in both a downwards direction from head to tail or cephalocaudal as it's called and from the center of the body outward, uh, what's called proximodistal development. And so when you look at the ability of infants to uh, lift their head and neck and turn their heads and later to roll over, uh, to sit up with support and then to sit up without support by about five to six months of age, you're seeing the maturational unfolding of motor abilities over time. Of course, once children have attained these uh, kind of passive postural abilities to sit and look around in their environments uh, around the middle of the first year, they quickly shift to more active kind of postures. For example, they'll tip forward and begin to either crawl or creep. The later they will pull themselves up and walk while holding on to your hands or uh, a coffee table or something of that sort. And by around the end of the first year, most infants take their first steps uh, without um, being supported by others. Of course, they may not start to prefer walking until uh, they're a year and a half or more in age. Uh, the idea is to get from here to there as quickly as possible, and crawling might suit those purposes, at least initially, um, better than walking does. But we can look at this rapid kind of sequential change and use it to uh, make determinations about the um, healthy or unhealthy growth of a young child. It's not so much uh, the rate of growth. Uh, what I mean is uh, infants who walk earlier are not by nature more athletic, for example. It's rather the sequence of growth and seeing that infants uh, extend their capacities, refine their motor abilities, and are able to engage in greater control of both large muscles and small muscles over the period of infant and toddler years. That's important. One other thing about this, underlying any kind of uh, muscular change and growth is the brain and nervous system. This is sort of the secret to looking at um, physical motor growth, not just in infancy and toddlerhood, but among preschool kids and school age kids and even adolescents. That is, what you see in their increasing ability to operate in the physical world is really an indication of how the brain and nervous system are developing. You know, of all the organs of the body, 
the brain is the most developed in terms of size at birth. Uh, babies are born with all of the neurons that they'll have for their entire life. In fact, they begin to lose neurons, uh, synaptically prune, as it's called, different pathways, while still in the womb. So babies are born with the approximately 100 billion neurons that uh, are in your and my brain as adults. But of course, uh, it's not just the number of neurons that you have, it's how they work. And uh, though the brain at birth is 25% of its adult weight, uh, an adult brain weighing about three pounds and a newborn brain weighing about three quarters of a pound, the connections between neurons and their ability to control movements in the body, as you know from looking at any baby, are fairly poor. In the first year, uh, the brain continues to grow very rapidly. By the time an infant is six months old, their brains are half their adult weight. By the time they're a year old, they are 70% of their adult weight. And uh, this acceleration continues through toddlerhood and into early childhood. And, uh, by the time a child is uh, uh, between four and six, their brain weight is already 95% of what it will be as an adult. So when you look at physical motor growth and it proceeds as it should, you're also seeing the evolution uh, of the healthy brain and its ability to monitor and control actions of the body. Um, even though your neurons are there at birth and the brain weighs 25% of its adult weight, there are many kinds of brain and nervous system growth still to take place. I'll mention one here, for example. Many of the nerves, particularly those that extend out into the body, are not fully myelinated. And you might remember from intro to psych that Myelinization refers to that myelin sheath or coating around the axons. Uh, an unmyelinated neuron sends a message at about uh, three feet a second, whereas a myelinated neuron sends the same message at 300 feet per second, about 100 times faster. And so when you're seeing children be able to uh, push themselves up or crawl or pull up and then walk, you're seeing the ability of the brain to rapidly send its messages out to literally millions of muscle fibers in a coordinated fashion that allows them to engage in uh, a voluntary motor activity that's fairly complex. Uh, so that is something I'd have you focus on. Um, cephalocaudal growth, proximodistal growth, and the way in which what you observe externally, that babies are more active and more interactive in their worlds, is also a sign of the quality of their underlying neurological development. Uh, this will come up again in the future when we talk, for example, about the acquisition of language in infancy, when we look at what's called cognitive growth, which is a little bit less easy to see because it's the mental world after all. Uh, we'll talk again about underlying uh, brain functions that are changing at the same time. Well, I'm going to close here, uh, uh, and during the week you'll be reading about a number of topics besides uh, brain and nervous system and uh, physical growth. You'll be reading about um, health in infants, uh, and it's a good time of year to think of health in infants as we head into winter, um, how to keep them healthy, how to not get them either too chilled or too warm. Um, how to take care of them. And we'll be talking and you'll be reading about in this chapter about uh, feeding of babies. Um, and you'll be noticing, hopefully, that uh, even though babies are born with all of their uh, systems working, uh, those systems are fairly incomplete in how well they work. So for example, the digestion system, while complete, doesn't really allow an infant to begin to um, absorb and utilize solid foods until relatively late in the first year. I'll leave those topics up to you for now. Uh, enjoy the week and uh, enjoy looking at infants and toddlers over the next few weeks.